think we, we might get started. My name is Duncan Williams, uh, the chair of the Center for Japanese Studies, and it's really an honor and privilege for me to uh, welcome you to this afternoon's event uh, with our keynote speaker, Sadako Ogata, uh, president of the Japanese International Cooperation Agency, JICA, and former UN High Commissioner for Refugees. We have a program for you this afternoon, uh, uh, US-Japan Global Responsibility and Development Assistance, a keynote speech, and a symposium immediately following uh, Japan's international relations, diplomacy, and foreign aid. This is part of a uh, series of events at our centers, Center for Japanese Studies, which is celebrating its 50th anniversary this uh, year, 2008 and 2009. And uh, Sadako Ogata is our keynote speaker for this month, uh, November. Uh, I'm going to ask my colleague in the political science department to give the formal introduction uh, of Ogata Sadako. And we are also honored today to be uh, in the presence of Dr. Uh, Robert Scalapino, uh, her mentor and teacher here at UC Berkeley, where uh, she uh, uh, obtained her PhD. And he will also make a few. Uh, remarks as well. And so I'm going to hand things over to uh, Steve Vogel to make the formal uh, introduction. Please welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Sarako Ogata and our, uh, my distinguished colleague, uh, Steve Vogel, to introduce her. Well, it's truly a great honor to introduce to you Sadaka Okata. She is perhaps Japan's most eminent diplomat and also the pride of the political science department here at Berkeley, where she earned a PhD in 1963. She was appointed president of the Japan International Cooperation Agency in 2003, and she still serves in that capacity. In this capacity, she presided over the agency's recent merger with the Japan Bank for International Cooperation. <coughs> she was UN High Commissioner for Refugees from 1990 through 2000. In that capacity, she was known for uh, coping with crises of the internally displaced persons in the Kurdish region of Iraq, the Balkans, Afghanistan, and Africa. She was recognized as one of the top 10 most influential women in the world during this period. Prior to her service uh, of the Japanese government, she taught for many years uh, in international politics at Sophia University. She is the recipient of numerous awards for her humanitarian service, the Prize for Freedom by Liberty, Liberal International, she won the Liberty Medal for efforts as UN High Commissioner for Refugees. From UC Berkeley, she won the Chancellor's Distinguished Honor Award. She also has earned the Fulbright Prize for International Understanding and the Great Negotiator Award from Harvard Law School. Um, to add a personal touch to this um, introduction, I would like to call on Professor Robert Scalapino who probably needs no introduction, but I will remind you that he founded the Institute of East Asian Studies here at Berkeley. He was chair of the political science department, and perhaps most importantly, he was a mentor uh, for uh, Sarako Ogata. Uh, One of the great privileges of being a professor is to observe the subsequent developments with respect to one's students. And I have always been very proud to have Sada as one of my students. Uh, we go back to, I think, 1956. My wife and I picked Sada up at the airport brought her in. Uh, the thing that has always impressed me is the combination of high intellect, of a serious concern about issues and a knowledge of issues, 
and uh, a willingness and ability to interact with all sorts of people uh, above and below her in status. I won't go into the details of her career because that has already been done very, uh, very well by Steve Vogel. I will simply close by saying that uh, when Sada got her PhD in 1963, uh, none of us imagined the illustrious career she would subsequently have, not only in public life, but in teaching in universities. So it's a great privilege to have her here today, Sada. Without any further ado, let me please welcome Sarah Bowman. Thank you very much, Professor Vogel, Professor Scalapino. It is a real privilege and a pleasure to be here. It's been quite a few years since I visited Berkeley. But today, at the occasion of the 50th anniversary of UC Berkeley Center for Japanese Studies, I really came to sort of uh, congratulate Bob on his coming 90th birthday, as I was told, which is still a year ahead. But uh, I, I didn't really realize that this seminar was given this big title of uh, US-Japan Global Responsibility and Development Assistance. And so I will try to talk about that. But let me say a few words about Bob, because I wouldn't be here in Berkeley without having had so much uh, friendship and also tutoring by Bob. Um, I would, he is close to celebrating his 90th birthday next year. And the last time I spent any time here in Berkeley was uh, almost uh, 10 years ago, nine years ago. Uh, when, when I was asked to be the co-chair of the celebration of Bob's uh, 80th birthday. <laughs> and I must say, Bob seems to be still going very, very strong, writing, teaching, and traveling, more than ever. He just came back from uh, China, I think, told me. On that celebration, nine years ago, I had the privilege of making a few opening remarks followed by the most extensive and lively slideshow that was presented by Dee, Mrs. Scalapino. And I'm very sorry that Dee is no longer with us, but she would have been very happy to find Bob here, closer to his 90th, with all his friends and students. Um, for many of us here, including those of us who are here as students from different parts of Asia, Bob's lectures and seminars were always fascinating. And he was an articulate lecturer and stimulating sem seminar director. And in spite of his very busy schedule, he always had time for students. And this is something that I have tried to follow, but not necessarily so successfully. And his graduate students cherished the at-home seminars that he gave from time to time. And Dee was always there to welcome us. But before addressing the formal topic of today's seminar, the global responsibilities expected of the United States and Japan, let me expand a little bit more on Professor Scalapino, his personal contributions to the world at large. To me, he is indeed a living testimony to how a single professor can seriously impact a wide range of people and governments. Well, first let me touch on his academic contributions. Maybe not all of you remember that his early research work was dedicated to major East Asian studies, uh, countries, Japan, China, and Korea, and that his very first book, Democracy and Party Politics in Pre-War Japan, was really a masterpiece that provided the basis for generations of political scientists. He had a way of presenting existing situations as a given, from which he would elaborate the future course. Nationalism, communism, democracy, labor movements, and economic development were used as focal concepts 
to predict future directions and change. And with him, every country study served as a basis for larger regional and comparative studies. At least in the Asia Pacific region, I do not think there was any area that he had not covered. Second, I would like to refer to his role in academic institution building. Aside from contributing to consolidating and expanding the East Asia related study, institu study in institutions as Berkeley, he contributed to the strengthening of the teaching and research capabilities of universities in many Asian countries. Beijing and Seoul University campuses enjoyed his presence at his residence too. He also spent time in Mongolia, Bhutan, among other countries. And at these uh, Asian universities and research institutes, his ob objectives went beyond classroom teaching. He strengthened their policy planning and implementation capacities. And many of these students became cabinet ministers, diplomats, and corporate leaders. Some even became senior military and police officers, as I recall, not to speak of academics the second generation Scalapinos, teachers who are all over the place. And one more area, the third area of action which I wish to refer to is the important policy advice he gave to governments. Professor Scalapino never accepted any government position, if I remember correctly. But I wish to emphasize the important policy role he played. Participants with regard, particularly with regard to key Asian related issues. It was in the late 1950s when questions were raised in US Japan in United States political circles on the policy options with regard to the future of the People's Republic of China. Bob led a group of scholars who prepared the Kwanlon Associates Report. This document outlined the course of change for America's China policy and contributed to the ultimate course of normalization or relations between the United States and China. Other examples show the important contacts and consultations initiated by him that settled complex issues and led to the improvement of situations in many Asian hotspots. What made Professor Scalapino special was the credibility as an independent scholar with no personal agenda, dedicated to the solution of problems and improvement of relations among Asian states. Being here with the Berkeley community, I am reminded of my surprise to find the representatives from both North and South Korea at Bob's 80th birthday celebrations. I don't know who will come on his 90th birthday, but I wanted to say these words in order to get you prepared for the coming 90th birthday celebrations. Now, I wish to turn to the central issue that I have been asked to address, US Japan, global responsibility with special reference to development assistance. Up to and throughout the Cold War period, both Japan and the United States knew where they stood. For the United States, the alliance with Japan was a key element of the American security architecture. While fully under the US security patronage, Japan focused its efforts on economic recovery and growth. The early post-war recovery assistance owed greatly to U.S. Garioa Fund and humanitarian help from UNICEF and other international organizations. The World Bank provided recovery fund for infrastructure reconstruction for electricity, roads, and railways. Although a recipient of international assistance, in 1954, Japan joined the Colombo Plan for cooperative economic and social development in Asia and Pacific. With other Asian countries, Japan concluded reparation agreements and undertook economic cooperation programs centering on technical training. Japan's development assistance had an early start focused on Asian recovery and economic growth. It was perceived as the sign of proof to take on an internationalist posture. The amount of Japan's ODA grew in parallel to Japan's economic growth. In security matters, however, it remained reserved, reflecting its pacifist and non-military posture after the war. Throughout the Cold War period, Japan maintained the early post-war posture. 
its economy boomed, while prime ministers Fukuda, Nakasone, and their successors, I mean their fathers and grandfathers, not the current <laughs> Nakasone, <laughs> and their successors advocated Japan to expand its international cooperation, their views were reflected in substantial increase of ODA. In a sign of proof of incorporating a humanitarian and Asian solidarity stance, in 1979, took the unprecedented step of accepting over 10,000 Indo-Chinese refugees. The first case of confrontation between the United States and Japan over the issue of Japan's security role broke out at the time of the 1990-91 Gulf War. By the late 1980s, Japan had become the largest creditor nation of the United States purchasing U.S. government bonds and substantial real estates, including the landmark Rockefeller Center in New York. The hardworking and uh, industrial image of Japan, as ex exemplified in Ezra Vogel's Japan as number one, started to fall out of fashion. Critical views that Japan was not sharing enough of the world economic and security burden began to dominate. The Gulf crisis represented a critical situation. Japan was not ready to send its military in support of Operation Desert Storm when 70% of Japan's oil imports came from the Gulf region. The United States started to exert strong pressure on Japan. And Japan was perceived as a country, not ready to shoulder a fair share of what was conceived, conceived as the international burden. At the time, there was much debate in Japan. What do I do? At that time, there was much debate in Japan on measures to be taken on diplomatic and constitutional grounds. The question of troop dispatch abroad was considered unconstitutional. Considerable time, time elapsed, and at the end, taxes were specially raised to enable Japan. And, and Japan uh, to contribute some 13 billion US dollars to Desert Storm. This amount was considered substantial since it was more than its annual total development assistance budget. At the end, however, the Japanese side observed that very little appreciation was shown by the US side. Even to this day, this remains as a bitter memory and it haunts I think some of the policy makers in charge of dealing with US demands for greater security related contribution, which continues until today. After the Gulf experience, however, Japan tried to adopt an internationalist step by passing the UN peacekeeping cooperation law in June 1992. Its immediate outcomes were the dispatch of observers to monitor a series of elections starting from Angola the deployment of self-defense forces to support the UN Transitional Administration for Cambodia, and to ONUMOS in Mozambique. In 1994, self-defense forces were sent to Goma in the then Zaire to assist UNHCR and other humanitarian agencies that cope with a massive Rwandan refugee emergency. These interventions, which included the unprecedented dispatch of military forces, may be understood as departure from the traditional cautious participation in international military or peacekeeping operations. However, I think it should be noted that these expedi expedition cases were carefully selected and very much limited to safeguard the forces from becoming really involved in direct military combats in order to be in line with the prevailing public mode of non-militaristic and pacifist consensus. After the Gulf War and throughout the 1990s, the United States and Japan served as major providers of material and financial support to UN and coalition-led security operations. But after the abortive Somalia operation in 1993, the United States became cautious in dispatching ground troops or even approving UN peacekeeping forces. Whether in the Balkans or the Great Lakes region of Africa, Humanitarian agencies such as UNHCR, and I know this very well because I was in charge, they were left to protect fleeing refugees and civilian victims, keeping them alive 
and helping them return home in safety. The peace building missions of rebuilding communities and states were also largely left to the hands of international humanitarian and development agencies. In many other crisis situations that unfolded in Afghanistan, Angola, Southern Sudan, or Sierra Leone, no global leadership emerged to mobilize international action. And I personally recall the sense of helplessness as innocent people were left to suffer and no forces intervened adequately to bring the crisis under control. And we're seeing the same thing happening in the Congo again right now. In both the United States and Japan, I recall this period as being marked by increasing inward-looking trends. In Japan, the economy underwent a long period of stagnation. In the United States, too, the public commitment to provide international leadership receded. Elected officials, media, and even civil society associations turned their focus on interna internal political agenda. The notable example reflecting the mood was the unpaid American budgetary contributions to the United Nations. These developments cast a heavy sh shadow on the organizational viability of the United Nations and spread the image of diminished American interest in exercising international commitments and leadership. The dramatic incident that changed the American scene and mobilized international ca action came in September 11, 2001. Traditionally, security threats were assumed to emanate from other states with aggressive or adversarial designs. People were pres presumably assured of their security by the shield of the state. Terrorism as such had always existed, but now took different dimensions. The attacks against the World Ta Trade Tower buildings in New York and the Pentagon were unprecedented. I was actually living in New York at that time and really followed the horror as well as the reaction of the American and the world public. But culprits of this ter terrorist attack consisted of a network of Al-Qaeda who were really uh, dissatisfied and angry elements from the Middle East. They had acquired means of moving across the international boundaries, gained access to free-flowing financial capital, and they took full advantage of advanced information and technical skills. The Bush administration embarked on the war on terrorism and led the military action against Afghanistan and Iraq. U.S.-Japan relations were affected by this new course of policy action. First of all, it is important to note the context in which the two military actions evolved and therefore the different modes of cooperation expected of the U.S. allies, particularly of Japan. While the Iraqi war was a, a full-scale military operation against the Iraqi government and Iraqi forces, the operations in Afghanistan were against Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, which had turned the country into a hotbed of insurgency. While the United States led the military operation with the help of Afghan Northern Alliance forces on the ground, a whole range of humanitarian and development activities were introduced to bring back the over six million refugees and a whole range of measures to rebuild Afghanistan into a functioning state. While with regard to Iraq, Japan's contributions were limited to the dispatch of a contingent, contingent to the relatively secure Samawa area in the south and the advancement of some 3.5 billion soft loan for construction, reconstruction purposes. Its role in Afghanistan turned substantial. Afghanistan became the forefront of Japanese post-conflict development assistance cooperation. And the Japanese government moved quickly at that time to take a lead in the reconstruction efforts and hosted the international conference on reconstruction of Afghanistan on 21, 22nd January 2002. As the special representative of the Prime Minister, I was assigned to co-chair this meeting together with the United States, European Union, and Saudi Arabia. Altogether, over 4.5 billion were pledged for a five-year reconstruction period, and needless to say, the establishment of nationwide security was essential in order to advance the process of state building. Some novel approach of role sharing was taken 
to divide responsibilities among the participating states. The United States and France were to train and rebuild the Afghan National Army. Germany was to train the National Police, and the United Kingdom took charge of controlling the narcotics industry. Japan opted for working on the demobilization and reintegration of former combatants. It was rather a novel undertaking for Japan in, in view of its limited traditional role, which had been taken, in the, taken up in the security sector. And the UN Security Council authorized the deplo deployment of the International Security Force to look after the security of Kabul. The United States, however, continued to fight its own war on terrorism in the South and Southeast with its own forces and support from local warlords. The fact that there was no unified international security operation throughout Afghanistan has complicated the consolidation of overall security in the country. And I think the improved security coverage will require effectively addressing the presence of Al-Qaeda and Taliban sanctuaries in neighboring Pakistan and other areas. Japan has been replenishing support to the maritime interdiction operations in the Indian Ocean. And as of today, Japan's main contributions to Afghan reconstruction have been in the economic and social development and infrastructure enhancement. Last week, I had the great pleasure of being present at the opening ceremony of the Kabul National International Airport, which Japan initiated and the uh, airport started the airport reconstruction in 2003 and completed this 13 million project along with the capacity building for the airport management, including staff training. And I was very happy to see this, although the security situation in Afghanistan has much to be desired. I expect the airport to serve as the gateway for enhancing communication and collaboration between the Afghan people and the international community. And it would also stand as a proof for possibility for peace and progress once we overcome the unstable security situation. Up to the present, Japan has acted as the leading country in Afghan development, having focused on social programs such as education and health, agriculture and rural development, and roads and other infrastructure development, totaling some $2 billion. My office, JICA, has operational presence not only in Kabul, but in other cities, Mazar, um, Mazar Sharif, Jalalabad, Bamiyan, etc. But due to security deterioration, our projects in Kandahar are being supervised mainly by JICA's local staff. And this is the kind of arrangement that many other countries are making these days. One large master plan that JICA is currently preparing is the development of Kabul metropolitan area. In response to the strong request of the Afghan government to improve the functioning of the overcrowded Kabul. The plan has in view the renewal of water supply, sewage development management, and ring road installment. In addition, it's not working. Okay. In addition, a new Directly area into. development is foreseen to the north with the potential of bringing in investment for expanded residential and official place. I think I am talking a lot about Afghanistan because I've been in directly involved. In fact, I started my current trip from visiting Afghanistan. But I think what Japan has been doing in Afghanistan through development assistance symbolizes its strength as a soft power building nation. And JICA is the conduit of Japanese official development assistance, the ODA. And in the last few years, Japan has been rapidly expanding its development aid to Africa, also focusing on poverty reduction, economic growth acceleration, and beyond. And having now served as the president of JICA for five years, I am fully conscious of the relevance of Japan's development assistance to promoting world peace and prosperity. Certainly, soft power approach alone cannot save the world from war, terrorism, and injustice. But at the same time, hard power alone will not be necessarily bringing peace and prosperity to the world. 
Today we live in a globalizing world. Neither the existing economic nor security institutions have proven sufficient in coping with the challenges ahead. There are no adequate machineries for dealing with climate change, energy security, spread of nuclear materials and diseases. There are no UN or regional peacekeeping or policing operations that are meeting the existing needs and even forthcoming needs. Drug and human trafficking at the scale and speed that they cross borders are hardly addressed. Terrorism is still a threat that has to be addressed not only by force, alone, but by a combination of economic, social, and political measures to overcome injustice and misery. With better insight into the needs of the globalizing times, governments will have to now come up with better schemes for a new international architecture. People cannot be left in situations of abject poverty, uncertainty, and threat. Development assistance is certainly a tool that can address the needs of the people in developing countries and in fragile situations. And I take it as my personal responsibility to tune up what we have in JICA so that we will be able to contribute more positively to what is needed in the world. Development assistance must embark on a dynamic process. Poverty reduction requires more than economic growth. On the one hand, it has to tackle the problems associated with the effects of globalization. On the other hand, it must cover more directly the specific socioeconomic problems faced by people everywhere. Overall, new governing structures and systems will have to be worked out that addresses the widest range of issues for all the people. These are the times that require the United States and Japan to join hands to review where we stand and to plan for the future. We share both the basic values and commitments to the future. We have our specific respective special interests, but overall resources to share to each other's advantage. Mutual respect and continuing close consultation will bring great benefit to the world now in transit and are awaiting our contributions. And I think this is a very opportune time as the United States is going to, to uh, welcome a new administration. Well, we all must all join in to make this forthcoming leadership role of expected of the United States to really bring some changes to the world. Thank you very much. Before we shift to our panel, I'd just like to ask if there are any questions for the floor. I think we have time for one or two questions for Dr. Obeta. Um, Please speak up. student of peace and conflict studies, I learned that um, up until now, U.S. government has believed in um, negative peace rather than positive peace. And um, for those of you who don't know this term, um, negative peace means that there's no war, and positive, mean, positive peace means that people um, are living in a decent uh, environment. Uh, with um, human rights protected. And I personally feel there is a difference between Japanese government and American government um, viewpoint on that. Um, could you please uh, tell us how you think about this issue and what is your own view on this? Well, I think it would be very simplistic to say that you Americans and the Japanese governments or people have entirely different values and objectives. That would be too much to say. To say that they're identical is also too much to say. At the same time, when you say war and peace, the nature of war is changing, and nature of peace is changing. And I think what has been done, has to be done now, is that state responsibilities, and meaning of state responsibilities, are also changing. States cannot control everything. Maybe this is the change in the socioeconomic structures. People do count. 
but they may, you may think they're not counting enough. And what would be very important is that young people like yourselves make the world more, yourselves more accountable to the big changes required in this world. I would not say that Japan and I mean, even in the Jap among the Japanese, I'm sure there are differences. And even among the Americans, there's a wide range. That's why this interest, the presidential elect election that just took, oh, took place in America was most interesting. And in that America was able to bring out to the open some of the variation of differences that people in this country were holding. So I'm not answering, but I can't answer your question because it's a bit too, um, shall I say, simple. <laughs> to say this that, or that. There was a hand here. Um, all right. On that note, I'd like to thank Dr. Obeta. Um, we are now going to take a one minute break, so feel free, to, uh, because the caterers are going to bring in some food for our reception later. Please feel free to stretch, but don't stray too far. We'll be recommencing <laughs> very soon. A very quick announcement. I did want to uh, thank uh, our co-sponsors for this event uh, with uh, uh, Ogata Sadako. Um, we have three co-sponsors, our own IAES Shorenstein Fund, uh, the great support of the uh, Japan Society for Promotion of Science, JSPS, and our uh, Consulate General of Japan here in San Francisco all helped to support this event. So I just wanted to acknowledge and thank them for that. Just another very quick note. I know many of you got this uh, 50th anniversary calendar. Well, one thing is our next event in December, um, the baseball event. I just wanted to ask you to note that it starts at 9 a.m. Uh, it, it, it's a shift that we've had to make because of our Cal football game that's happening that afternoon. It's really important not to mix up baseball and football, and uh, we, we wanted to have a great uh, sports day on that. So just a quick note about our baseball event is happening at 9 a.m. rather than at noon. And I'd like to hand things back over to uh, Steve Vogel to introduce our great panel of speakers uh, who will be responding as well as giving their own uh, perspectives on uh, international relations in Japan today. Uh, we have an incredible panel of three distinguished panelists for you. Um, I want to introduce all three of them so that then they can speak without my interruption. We are going to begin with Shinichi Okidaoka, who is one of Japan's leading experts on foreign affairs and diplomatic history. He is currently a professor at the Faculty of Law at the University of Tokyo. He has also served in a diplomatic capacity as Japan's deputy permanent representative in the United States in the United Nations from 2004 to 2006. He has served as a member of the advisory panel to Prime Minister Miyazawa, on Japan and Asia Pacific of the 21st century, as a member of Prime Minister Obuchi's Commission on Japan's Goals of the 21st century, and as a member of Prime Minister Koizumi's Task Force on Foreign Affairs. He has received many awards and honors, um, including the Yoshida Shigeru Prize and the Yomiuri Prize as Opinion Leader of the Year. He has a wide range of publications, which include um, a book on the political dynamics of the United Nations, Japan's position, uh, published in 2007, um, and Pride and Self-Dependence, The Challenge of Fukuzawa Yukichi, uh, 2002, and Toward a Normal Country in 2000. Dr. Takatoshi Ito is one of Japan's preeminent economists. He's a professor at the Graduate School of Economics, also at the University of Tokyo. As well as Japan, he has taught extensively in the United States. He was a member of Japan's Council on Economic and Fiscal Policy in the uh, government of Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. From 1999 to 2001, he was Deputy Vice Minister for International Finance in the Ministry of Finance. And he's also served as senior advisor in the research department of the International Monetary Fund 
from 1994 to 1997. He also has a very long list of publications, um, including most recently co-editing a book on reviving Japan's economy, problems and prescriptions. He is also the author of The Japan Japanese Economy, A Vision for the World Economy, and The Political Economy of Japanese Monetary Policy. My colleague T.J. Pempel joined Berkeley's Political Science Department in 2001 and has served as Director of the Institute of East Asian Studies from 2002 to 2006. Uh, his research focuses on comparative politics, political economy, contemporary Japan, and Asian regionalism. His most recent books include Remapping East Asia, The Construction of a Region, Beyond Bilateralism, U.S.-Japan Relations in the New Asia Pacific, the, the Politics of the Asian Economic Crisis, and Regime Shift, Comparative Dynamics of the Japanese Political Economy. Uh, please join me in welcoming our panel, beginning with Dr. Kidoka. Oh, thank you, Steve. Um, uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Ogata started with uh, praises to uh, Dr. Scalapino, can I speak with some words to uh, Dr. Ogata? Uh, very shortly, uh, Dr. Ogata is regarded as a Joan of Arc in Japan, or uh, 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 Mother Teresa of Japan, <laughs> something like that. Um, anyhow, the most uh, respected and trusted lady in Japan. Um, I can tell you one episode. Uh, in year 2000, when uh, Japan's politics was uh, uh, chaotic, it is still chaotic now, but anyhow, <laughs> at that time there was a movement to uh, uh, proceed her to be a prime minister, uh, organizing a new party under her. But uh, uh, because of the rise of Koizumi, with a lot of popularity, it's gone, very unfortunately. But uh, uh, she is still powerful and strong. So uh, uh, there may be another opportunity to ask her to stand up. Anyhow, um, uh, also I'd like to say uh, something about her career. She was, uh, after uh, Berkeley, she had some affiliation with the University of Tokyo and studied with, uh, uh, the under the guidance of uh, late Professor Yoshitake Oka, uh, who was a great historian of uh, modern Japanese politics and diplomacy, and who was also the mentor of my mentor. Uh, so this is a, a kind of a, another combination of uh, Berkeley, uh, University of Tokyo, and then I, I believe that Stephen Duncan uh, just returned from Tokyo uh, on uh, Berkeley uh, Tokyo Symposium, so uh, I'm very happy to see the, uh, another effort to strengthen the uh, relations between two uh, big academic institutions. Uh, one more footnote is that uh, though she had an excellent background, excellent education, but her career was not very smooth at the very beginning. She got, if I'm not mistaken, she got her tenure in, in her mid-40s. And then this is, uh, but after that, her, her rise was very remarkable. So this is a revelation, blessing to the working ladies, working mothers, and uh, aged people. Now, uh, let me get to the, the topic of this discussion. Um, I, I believe that the Japan's most important responsibility to the world is to remain as a powerful economy, as uh, was pointed out by Prime Minister Aso at the General Assembly discussion in September this year. But this topic will be covered by my, my colleague Ito-san. And then another responsibility for Japan is to contribute to the maintenance of peace and order in East Asia and Asia as a whole, because Asia is a very important a region to support the, uh, the international uh, stability and growth. But let me confine in this occasion to make a comment and uh, expressing some of my views uh, related to the uh, presentations made by Dr. Ogata. First of all, about the official development aid by Japan, it's not in a good shape. 
Japan has been number one uh, donor in the 1990s, but uh, 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 several years ago, it dropped to second. That's okay, because Japan is the second biggest economy. But a few years ago, it dropped to number three. Last year, it dropped to number five, after US, UK, Germany, France. But I'm not very much pessimistic about this, though uh, my colleague Vito may have a different opinion. Uh, partly because of the appreciation of yen, it might have uh, flown up a little bit. And also, the other countries may uh, decrease the offshore development aid, and uh, uh, Japanese government may increase offshore development aid, hopefully. Uh, but uh, when it comes to the security area, the uh, Japan's contribution to the United Nations peacekeeping operation is a, it's a shame. Uh, Japan is uh, sending only 35 or uh, roughly 35 people on the ground, uh, while the, uh, as a whole, 80,000 uh, peacekeepers were deployed in the world. And then that, is, that means that Japan is, uh, Japan's share is 0.04%. It's a great shame, because it's far less than, uh, when, uh, than 1992, for example, when uh, Japan joined the Cambodia uh, peacekeeping operation. At that time, we sent, we sent some uh, several hundreds. And also, we sent some several hundreds to Eastern Timor. Although now, it's uh, far less than that. Uh, at least, uh, uh, I hope that Japan can shoulder 1%, minimum 1% of the peacekeepers, which may mean uh, 800, something like that, which is not uh, impossible for us. So there's a big imbalance between the Japan's contribution in uh, economic area and the Japan's contribution in security area. This is uh, one big problem. But I can tell, uh, uh, I don't understand why uh, Dr. Ogata touched upon this. Uh, there is another contribution by Japan, which is uh, some conceptual, conceptual innovation in uh, development aid and peace process, which is uh, human security, of course. The uh, idea of human security was, uh, did exist so for several, a few decades. But it was uh, in 1998 when uh, Prime Minister Obuchi made it very public to the international community. And then since then, uh, Japan contributed uh, some money to the United Nations and created a human, human security fund, which was co-chaired by uh, Dr. Ogata. So this is another great contribution of her to the international community. The, after that, in the uh, year 2005, the concept of human security was written, written in the, in the uh, uh, UN uh, uh, summit outcome document, which was uh, done in uh, September 2005. Human security is a, a concept like this. The, you know, the, the problem of uh, conflicts today is that uh, the biggest problem is that it will happen again, again and again. The percentage is about 50%. If we can be successful in solving the situation, but it will happen again with a percentage of 50%. So what's important is how to consolidate peace. So that we have uh, looked at, international community has looked at the ceasefire process, but second phase uh, from ceasefire to uh, consolidation and to development. This is very important. What's the best way to do this? The, our concept is that when the people, the major player is the people over there. And when the people begin to work and uh, uh, live with the expectation for the better future, then peace will be consolidated. So in order to do that, we are going to support, provide the water uh, 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 and then primary education, food, and also help them uh, from uh, help them, uh, the, the public health. Uh, by so doing, if they are uh, equipped with uh, some primary education with uh, good health, then they are going to start working. That will contribute 
to the peace process. So uh, this is a very important uh, contribution of Japan, and particularly by Dr. Ogata. The, the, uh, we have provided this uh, conceptual, uh, conceptual innovation, human security. Uh, the topic uh, Dr. Ogata spoke about, the Afghanistan issue, has something to do with this. In Afghanistan, certainly there was a war fighting. At the same time, uh, there are people living over there. And people are the major players in the field. So when uh, they, their uh, livelihood becomes better, and when they, are, uh, they have a better expectation for the future, then that will consolidate the peace. Now, uh, Japan is uh, uh, giving some indirect assistance to uh, OEF uh, Operation Enduring Freedom, and, but Japan is not part of uh, ISAF, International Security Assistance Forces, but Japan is doing some effort on the ground, led by JICA mainly. My idea is that what is necessary on Afghanistan, which is one of the most important uh, issues in the world today, is uh, what's important is uh, a kind of redefinition of the war against terrorism and also an a, a effort of uh, responsibility sharing among major players. Let me say that uh, the war against terrorism is very different from other wars because uh, in other type of ordinary wars, we can expect the end of war by the surrender of the enemy. But uh, there we cannot expect any surrender of the enemy. Uh, it's like a war against cancer. Uh, we have to do a lot of things uh, to decrease the number of victims of cancer, as well as the number of uh, terrorism, uh, to a certain level, below a certain level, which is acceptable to us. But at the same time, this is a kind of war. In the war, what's important is how to isolate the hardliners, the uh, diehard terrorist type of people, and how to get the moderate people on our side. In order to do that, there have to be a lot of things to be done. A one, a dialogue between the religions, different cultures, and so forth. Also, uh, giving a better living standard to them, including the alternate livelihood or alternate crops, because many of the people are living on puppy, opium over there. And then uh, the supporting the, the government, creating their security forces, a lot of things. But the problem is that what kind of division of labor should be done over there? Uh, now, as uh, Dr. Ogata pointed out, uh, Every ISAF, OEF, and Japan, and other countries are doing separately. There should be another conference, international conference, on a comprehensive strategy against terrorism, how to solve the Afghanistan issue, and then uh, Japan will continue and Japan will increase its effort on the ground to bring the uh, better livelihood and uh, uh, based on a human security concept. At the same time, Japan should not shy away from uh, playing a more important role in security area also. Uh, I, in my understanding, I think Japan should join, should continue the uh, indirect, assistan indirect assistance to uh, OEF, and Japan should join in ISAF. And by joining in it, Japan can have some voice in it, how, how ISAF should behave. And then, uh, well, we will continue our efforts on, uh, based on the human security concept. Uh, why Japan is so much uh, backward in the contribution in the security area? I have many opinions to say, but uh, the, the time is uh, close. So uh, if there is a time, uh, I will I'd love to discuss about the constraints, but uh, I stop here to hand it to you. Okay. Um, I'm, uh, I realize I'm only economist among the four presenters uh, uh, here. 
And um, um, I will not apologize for that, but um, uh, I will give the uh, different perspective uh, to this um, uh, symposium, I think. Now, uh, let me pick up from uh, what uh, 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 Dr. Ogata and also Dr. Kitaoka uh, mentioned. Uh, that is the ODA, Official Development um, uh, Aid. And as uh, Professor Kitaoka mentioned, that Japan was the number one contributor in terms of the um, absolute uh, uh, dollars uh, uh, from 1991 to 1999. And um, um, then uh, dropped to uh, maybe fifth place or sixth place uh, um, uh, this year. Now, um, the absolute, it, it's uh, uh, re re relative standing uh, is dropping, but also the absolute amount has been dropping. And um, uh, the, it's, it's like a 40%, for zero percent uh, drop uh, in uh, uh, 11 years. So um, it is not that other countries are uh, putting a lot of more money uh, to ODA, but the Japanese uh, <coughs> contribution, absolute contribution, has been uh, uh, dropping. Now, um, why is that? Um, I give three uh, reasons which um, I thought of, it's, it's not really, uh, uh, it may not be shared by others. The first one is that uh, Japanese fiscal, fiscal situation is uh, really terrible. Um, the governments, the central government and, and local governments, the general government has um, accumulated the 160% of uh, GDP as the government debt, okay? So so-called debt to GDP ratio is 160%, 160. And this is way above the other G7 uh, countries. The second one is uh, Italy, like uh, 100%. But other uh, US, uh, uh, UK, France, Germany, in the range of uh, 50 to 70%. So Japan, as Japanese government, is a huge debtor uh, to, the, uh, to the people of Japan. Most of the debts are owned by Japanese uh, 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 residents. So um, there is um, uh, uh, limits that Japan can uh, do uh, in uh, fiscal expenditure, both domestic and uh, international. Um, second reason why the um, uh, ODA is, uh, uh, is decreasing is actually the Koizumi reform, which is um, otherwise praised for reviving Japanese uh, uh, economy. One of the platform Prime Minister Koizumi had uh, was to cut the expenditures, cut expenditures across the board. So uh, he, he and his uh, uh, chief um, uh, uh, economic uh, uh, advisor, Mr. Takenaka, uh, put a ceiling on the uh, expenditure, and ceiling should be uh, uh, decreasing uh, 3% a year. The primary reason for this uh, uh, expenditure cut was to reduce the um, public works program, like building roads, bridges, and tunnels, because we knew that those uh, uh, public works, building roads and, and tunnels and, and, and um, uh, bridges, uh, were done in the area nobody was driving. So it was they're building the tunnels and bridges going nowhere, right? So it was a waste for uh, uh, spending, and it was correct to say that uh, these spending should be cut. But politically, it is very difficult to, uh, to reduce those uh, uh, spending because of the, every politician wants to have the uh, highway 
to come to uh, his or her village. So the way to reduce it was to put the ceiling across the board so nobody can complain. Everything, all the expenditure should be cut. And some amount should be uh, uh, siphoned to the prime minister's office to put, the pri to, to put into the priority areas. And some sacred areas like social securities, which it was due to increase because of the aging and pensioners, uh, the number of pensioners increasing. So those uh, exceptional areas were uh, social securities and prime minister's, uh, prime minister's um, uh, priorities. But ODA was not prime, prime minister's, uh, uh, prime minister's um, uh, 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 priorities. Um, actually, I, I think the uh, looking back, uh, Koizumi reform was great in the domestic reform, but international aspect was uh, very weak. The uh, uh, free trade agreement, uh, WTO, those push was very weak in uh, Koizumi uh, uh, government, and also uh, ODA and international uh, uh, relations uh, uh, push uh, was very weak in uh, uh, Koizumi reform. The third reason why the ODA has been dropping uh, is that, uh, related to the second one, there is no political uh, uh, support. Um, well, the, uh, giving ODAs to uh, the rest of the world, they are not voters. So uh, every local polit uh, politician who is, uh, uh, is uh, fighting uh, in the contest, close contest with opposition parties, would not be uh, uh, would not be uh, uh, in favor of increasing uh, ODA. So the more political close contest with opposition parties that they want a game going back to public works rather than uh, ODA. Um, and also, I would say this this may be uh, contradicted by maybe contradicted by Professor Kitaoka is that I think the um, uh, uh, aspiration of Japan to become a uh, soft power uh, uh, great nation uh, is, uh, is waning. That uh, more, more precisely that the aspiration uh, to become the permanent seat member of the United Nations um, has become uh, weaker. Maybe fatigue. You know, uh, we, we thought of putting everything to, uh, to become the next, uh, uh, in the next reform of the permanent seat of uh, Security Councils that Japan will be a shoe-in with Germany. And we fought that uh, for the reform, but didn't realize, and people became politicians and, and citizens became uh, uh, sort of fatigued. And so uh, if we cannot become a uh, 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 permanent seat member, why should we be putting lots of money uh, and, um, uh, to, to the ODA and uh, uh, try to send uh, troops uh, to Afghanistan, uh, possibly? Uh, and so th this is irony, because when ODA was increasing and a lot of uh, aid was given, that was, the plan was sold as the, to become the permanent seat or to become the bigger voice in UN, we need to put money, we need to send troops, uh, and so on. So when you realize that it, you know, to become permanent seat member is very remote because of the international politics, that support has waned. That, that's my interpretation. This may be contradicted. Um, the another reason why no political support is um, getting is a more general dynamics of the Japanese uh, uh, society and uh, economy. That is the aging of the society uh, and the uh, smaller uh, uh, number of children. Uh, fertility rate is, uh, is uh, uh, going down. So when, uh, th this is a so socioeconomic um, uh, uh, hypothesis that 
when you are only child, like myself, uh, you, you are uh, guaranteed to uh, inherit the parent's house, right? So if you are living in the rural area, you are only child, you inherit the farm, you inherit the small businesses, and no one uh, in the family is going to Tokyo or abroad to explore new frontiers. Before the war, that there are many children in, in the family. The oldest son uh, was guaranteed to inherit because of the old law uh, uh, dictated that. But the second son, third son, uh, went to Tokyo and went to the abroad uh, to explore uh, frontiers. Now, everybody is very defensive and conservative and, um, uh, and, and content. Um, this is, I think, the social, socioeconomic dynamics uh, is working against Japan to, uh, to be vibrant and the uh, more uh, international. So um, again, the aspiration is lost to, uh, to be really mobile and internationally active, uh, even within the domestic uh, uh, content that uh, uh, not uh, uh, really looking out, looking for the great opportunities. Um, some people think that uh, uh, Japanese uh, people become too affluent uh, to be, uh, uh, to be uh, challenging, um, but I'm not sure. Um, but again, we, we notice that uh, uh, it's, it's not, I, I think the uh, aspiration of the students um, uh, to, to go abroad for study um, has, I think, peaked out. Uh, it's not increasing anymore. Uh, it is um, a bit uh, uh, surprising uh, uh, in this age of the globalization. Okay, I'm gonna shift very quickly to the, uh, uh, the Japanese co uh, contribution to, to the um, international uh, organizations uh, in the finance area. So uh, uh, in, uh, international financial uh, uh, organization institutions, we usually include uh, the World Bank, uh, the IMF, uh, and other regional development bank. In these financial institutions, uh, Japan is uh, uh, one, one of the, uh, 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 the uh, top um, uh, shareholders. Usually, uh, we, we say we are number two uh, in, uh, in the quota, which is the shares that we contribute to the, uh, the World Bank and, and IMF. Um, more realistically, I would say number three, because now, nowadays the EU, uh, 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 European nations uh, uh, try to have the one voice in diplomacy uh, and so on. So they, they try to exercise uh, their uh, influence in, in, uh, uh, in one voice. So for example, the IMF, the, um, uh, again, the international financial institutions that the voice the voting share is uh, proportional to uh, the quota share, share, shares that they, they contribute. So it's, uh, we, we usually contrast that to the United Nations where one country has one vote. In the World Bank and, and IMF, the voice is uh, proportional to the, uh, to the um, uh, wealth, uh, uh, roughly speaking. So uh, Japan uh, share in the uh, quota, which is a uh, uh, shareholding, uh, is about six to seven percent. GDP share of Japan in the world is somewhere between 10 to 12 percent. So it's a, a proportionally less than the Japanese uh, uh, economic uh, uh, size in the world. U.S., about a qu uh, quarter of the world GDP, 25% of GDP, has only 17.6% uh, in the quota of uh, IMF. But this 17% is very important <coughs> because the 85% uh, is a supermajority, which means that any important decision 
of the reorganization of IMF and so on has to have 85 percent uh, approval, so, which means that U.S. alone has a veto power. Well, the European countries uh, uh, counted individually is smaller than uh, Japan, both in the uh, GDP size uh, in, in, in the world economy or uh, the quota. Uh, in uh, uh, the share shareholding of the uh, IMF. However, if they are combined, European countries are combined, they have about uh, 33 to 35 percent of the world's GDP, and their quota in IMF is 33 percent. So in uh, a relative sense, the European countries have a uh, much larger voice than uh, United States or Japan. So the euro area countries, uh, one currency, one uh, uh, voice in uh, the, uh, international uh, uh, organizations, then uh, Europe, Europe, United Europe is the biggest voice, biggest money, uh, and uh, 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 strongest in influencing World Bank and um, IMF. Now, also, the World Bank traditionally has the uh, American as president uh, of the World Bank. In IMF, traditionally, always, the uh, uh, European uh, has been the managing director, which is uh, number one uh, uh, in, in the organization. So Japan as number two uh, in the quota share never occupies the top position in the two uh, international, two most important uh, international financial uh, organizations. So again, Japan has been uh, crying for bigger voice and um, uh, uh, more shares, but has not been uh, has not been realized. Uh, uh, I would say uh, very slow in realizing it. Now um, the. Uh, and also, the, among the finance ministries and central bank uh, uh, communities, Japan is always uh, uh, a part of G5 or G7 uh, more recently. Um, so in all important uh, decisions of the international financial uh, uh, frameworks that Japan has been a very important member has been contributing uh, to the uh, international coordination and, and cooperation. So maybe, probably, uh, slightly uh, better than the uh, international relations or the uh, international political uh, uh, arena uh, like United uh, uh, Nations. However, uh, even there, uh, the relative standing may be, uh, uh, may be uh, weakening because we have now the forum called G20. And uh, right this moment, they are meeting in uh, Washington, D.C. to, uh, to uh, talk about uh, the world financial crisis, which we are in right now. Uh, you, you may not feel yet uh, the damages, but uh, soon you will. And, um, uh, and also, the, uh, after this crisis, what to do? So they are talking, they're, they're exchanging ideas of how to reform this World Bank and uh, international monetary funds. And they may agree, they may not, uh, they may continue, but this G20 uh, meeting seems to uh, have become the important forum uh, to decide uh, uh, the uh, new world financial uh, 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 frameworks. So, um, again, Japan has, um, uh, in a relatively speaking, uh, is, has become uh, one of them rather than uh, the number two of the financial, uh, uh, international financial institutions. So it doesn't, uh, so, so, so far I've been very pessimistic. Okay, so the last topic which I spent, let me spend uh, two minutes, is the future. Okay, so, um, and this is more, uh, more of my uh, recommendations um, and uh, what should be rather than what uh, will be, uh, what, what, what will likely uh, uh, to be. Okay, 
Now, Japan, Japanese economy um, has been, um, as mentioned by uh, Dr. Ogata, um, stagnant for so many years. Uh, since 1992, the average growth rate uh, is like 1%. Uh, last few years, uh, during the Koizumi reform, it has revived up to 2%, but now this year and next year probably go back to uh, 1%. Um, so uh, first, uh, it was um, in the initial stage of this long stagnation, it was due to the burst of the bubble. So it, li it is like United States right now, that housing, mu housing bubble has burst, and um, uh, the lot of non-performing loans accumulated, and the banks uh, went down, and so on. But later, I think it was more of the policy mistakes that they did not promote the industries that they should have been promoting, and they tried to help the industries and, and, and agriculture that they shouldn't be uh, uh, just uh, handing out uh, money. So a Japanese economic policy has to change uh, uh, drastically uh, to promote uh, uh, growth. And the, the growing economy uh, is, uh, is a key uh, to have some uh, 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 some uh, uh, surplus to help the rest of the world. So contribution to the ODA uh, should grow uh, if and when the Japanese economy again uh, start to start to grow uh, uh, significantly. Um, second, I think the um, again I'm talking about what should be rather than what will will likely to be that I think the uh, ODA. Um, has to be uh, uh, promoted. The absolute term that ODA in the budget is only a small amount. You could cut some of the subsidies to, to the uh, rice farmers, then you can greatly help the uh, uh, people in Africa. Um, it's, a, it's a strange trade-off, but Japan has to think that, um, uh, that um, uh, uh, having the uh, greater contribution to the world may be better uh, uh, than uh, uh, wasteful uh, subsidies, which could be reformed. Um, the third, uh, which again I'm talking about what should be, is the um, uh, Japanese uh, um, education uh, uh, system has to be reformed that we are uh, producing uh, the students and uh, future leaders uh, not, to, uh, not to speak up and not to speak in international languages. It's only very recent that the, uh, even University of Tokyo is trying to promote the education uh, in uh, uh, more uh, interactive way and also in uh, uh, English. Uh, environment. And um, um, it, it is uh, not money in the end, that, but the uh, people and ideas uh, which contribute to, to the world. And um, uh, Mrs. Ogata is the uh, primary example that one person uh, could make a difference in the world and also the image of Japan. Thank you very much. As I was listening to uh, Professor Ito speak uh, about the ways in which Japan's fiscal crisis led to a dramatic reduction in ODA, long one of Japan's important milestones in contributing to uh, the betterment of the rest of the world, I was thinking of the situation of the budget here in California and the ways in which that has affected the budget of the university. Uh, and I'm fortunate, I guess, to uh, realize that Duncan was able to put this event together despite the budget cuts and was able to bring in three people from uh, abroad for this celebration. Uh, fortunately, I'm the, uh, I'm the cheapest uh, one with a, <laughs> with a one floor elevator ride that I will not uh, charge, the, uh, charge the Center for Japanese Studies. Uh, Dr. Ogata made some very warm and uh, warm remarks about uh, Bob Scalapino, and I certainly share those. I've ha had the good fortune to work with him over many years. Uh, but less well known, I think, is the fact that I actually have had a very warm spot for Dr. Ogata as well. 
Uh, when I was a graduate student, I had the good fortune to read her book, uh, the book that came out of her doctoral dissertation called Defiance in Manchuria. It was a study of the ways in which the Japanese military had during 1930 and 31 and 32 managed to move Japan away from the longtime pacifist trajectory on which it had moved for the bulk of its modernization and uh, which led to a military, the eventual military takeover of Japan and eventually uh, the imposition of military rule, fascism, authoritarianism in World War II. And uh, the combination of her book and Bob's book on democracy and party movements played a very key role in my first publication when I was a graduate student in 1966, uh, a completely forgettable uh, study of the rise of the military in Japan and Argentina in the 1930s. But I've always had a very warm spot in my heart for Dr. Ogata's academic work. And because of that, I've had a chance to uh, pay close attention to her non-academic career as well. And I think in many ways she follows in Bob's footsteps uh, with perhaps more of the balance on performance in the governmental world than in the academic world. But uh, certainly, they are a very good complement to one another. I think it's um, very important also to recognize that she provided a big force in the projection of Japan's soft power in a very multilateral way, both through the United Nations and now through JICA, uh, continually being a very good representative of Japan, while at the same time doing so in a multilateral context uh, rather than a single national context. And I guess my comments really start from her observations about the Gulf War in 1991 and the fact that in many ways this was a very unfortunate but catalytic event in Japan's foreign policy. As she correctly pointed out, uh, Japan felt that its pacifist const constitution prevented it from sending troops uh, in support of the American coalition to invade uh, Iraq and to return Kuwait and or to liberate Kuwait. Uh, but of course, Japan did provide a massive contribution, the largest of any single country, $13 billion. And the unfortunate aspects of that contribution were that Japan's contribution was dis dismissed in the United States as little more than checkbook diplomacy. Uh, and the Kuwaiti government, when it took out a full page ad thanking the various countries that had been part of the coalition that had liberated Kuwait, uh, failed completely even to mention Japan's contribution. So I think the, the legacy of that was in many ways very powerful for US-Japan relations. In many ways, I think it left a legacy of embarrassment in Japan uh, that Japan could not somehow provide boots on the ground. And in the United States, it left a legacy of demand, uh, the sense that checkbook diplomacy was irrelevant to being a major player in the larger world. Japan did, as she pointed out, play a large and substantial role in shifting toward allowing Japanese troops to participate in UN organized peacekeeping operations in many of the trouble spots around the world. And this, I think, represented a very interesting move away from the pure pacifism that had dominated Japan up until that time. But it was still, in my view, an extension of Japan's soft power. In many ways, it was a soft military power. Uh, and perhaps, as uh, has already been suggested, within this area, Japan could do substantially more. But uh, throughout the 90s, Japan played a very powerful role in humanitarian aid, in which Dr. Ogata, of course, played a substantial role herself. Uh, and this was culminated in the huge uh, organization of aid for Afghanistan, about which she spoke at great length, $4.5 billion designed to help reconstruct the nation. And uh, Japan's contribution was very powerfully directed toward the demobilization and reintegration of the combatant forces, which it seems to me all of which took great advantage of Japan's systematically developed strengths over the post-war period. That is to say, of being a major player, but doing so in ways that were both multilateral and simultaneously uh, were taking on some of the great crises that were being felt around in different parts of the world. She certainly is correct to say that the United States 
after 9-11 put incredible pressure on Japan to engage in power sharing. And I think this fell on very welcome Japanese ears. Many in the Japanese political and foreign policy establishments and defense establishments were anxious to see a larger role for Japan's military. And at least in my view, during the Bush-Koizumi overlap, there was a real shift in Japan's foreign policy away from its largely multilateral, largely balancing act between the United States and Asia into a shift that took on a much more prominent military role, one that was certainly very strongly advocated by the Bush administration in its own militarization of foreign policy and its own securitization of foreign policy. And Japan also moved, I think, substantially away from Asia under Koizumi and a move to a much tighter embrace of the United States around the Bush agenda. The specifics of this, of course, are, are a rather long laundry list of changes. The shift to, from an agency, a self-defense agency, to a ministry of defense, uh, the sending of troops not only to Afghanistan under the UN mandate, but under a much more uh, suspect mandate, sending troops to Iraq. Um, participation in theater missile defense, uh, engaging in uh, the launching of spy satellites and in some respects the militarization of outer space, uh, the agreement to allow the United States to move its headquarters for i corps to Camp Zama, and a close integration of communications and interoperability of U.S. and Japanese forces, and the possibility that Japan would suddenly move from defense of its own four islands or defense and security in Northeast Asia to becoming much more largely and uh, uh, systematically involved in the U.S. operations, U.S.-led operations as far abroad as the Middle East and uh, Central Asia and, uh, and South Asia. And uh, I think it's probably also important, and here again I'm reminded of um, Dr. Ogata's book about defiance in Manchuria and the rise of the military, I certainly think we're a long way from this in Japan, but I do think it's important to recognize that the political right has uh, begun to take a much larger role in Japanese politics uh, with Koizumi, but uh, also with Prime Ministers Abe and Aso uh, being far more outspoken in their views that Japan has a substantial military role to play, that uh, Japan should uh, play a substantial role in offsetting the military prowess of North Korea or of China. And uh, the danger, it seems to me, is that uh, Japan, by moving this direction, runs the risk of losing sight of the balanced position that it had maintained uh, prior to uh, the Bush administration and prior to uh, the last eight years under uh, the Bush administration in the United States. and. Uh, many of Japan's, um, uh, Japan's own uh, prime ministers. And the danger is, I think, that uh, by empowering the political right in Japan, the danger is that Japan moves further away from its engagement in Asia, further away from its monetary contributions and its uh, human contributions to human security, in which it has played a rather powerful and substantial role, into one that, in effect, uh, runs the risk of becoming uh, the United States' uh, deputy sheriff in Northeast Asia. And it seems to me that's neither a role for which Japan is adequately prepared nor one that will serve it well in the long-term future. Uh, now that's, the, um, uh, that's a view that probably not everyone in the room will share, but I think it's one that, uh, at least in my view, deserves to be underscored, uh, particularly as we're now seeing a new administration in Japan with Prime Minister Aso, uh, who comes with a considerable commitment to the more conservative forces in Japan, but who also seems to engage uh, a number of new ideas and new openness to policies that might include Japan in much greater multilateralization in East Asia, and also uh, has the opportunity to look afresh at many of uh, Japan's engagements. And he will be joined by a new administration in the United States under uh, President-elect Obama. And it seems to me that Japan and the United States, as they look toward the next several years, have the opportunity to recalibrate what, in my view, has been a somewhat overly militarized and overly uh, bilateral relationship over the last 
eight years or so into one that recommits itself to a more multilateral, uh, somewhat more pacifistic, somewhat, somewhat more economically oriented uh, foreign policy and area of cooperation that will attempt to uh, recommit to the broader human security issue that Dr. Ogata has been uh, so famously advancing during her career. So let me stop on that note and thank you very much. Thank you very much to all the uh, panelists. Um, before I uh, open the floor for any questions, let me just briefly ask Dr. Ogata, would you like to make any comments or response? Or it's up to you, either way. What Dr. Pimple really analyzed is exactly where I would share a lot of his analysis and the worries as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, we are closing in on time, but I would like to leave time for a couple of questions. Um, once I identify you, please wait for the, the mic to get to you. Okay, that's right here. All right. Uh, my name is Keiko Yamanaka. I teach as a lecturer in the uh, Department of Ethnic Studies as well as um, Asian Studies. Uh, Professor Ito, I appreciated your comments on social, contemporary social issues in Japan, uh, including uh, declining fertility. Now, uh, you have also mentioned uh, lower, lowering aspirations among uh, Japan's young generations. However, I do have a different observations. That is, <laughs> uh, you look around the people here, half are Japanese women, probably, and then they are well-educated and highly capable, uh, English-speaking, and very capable people. Uh, in my classes, I have taught a number of Japanese women who came uh, and then graduated with a bachelor's degree uh, from University of California, Berkeley, and these women all worried about what am I going to do if I return to Japan? I will have no jobs. Corporations do not accept us. And now today, with this declining economic climate in Japan, now women are re-entering the glacier period. That's what the mass media reports, glacier. That means, you know, all ice age, for, especially for women uh, in the corporate door. Now, my interest is that if, uh, well, low fertility is not the uh, phenomenon only in Japan, but also in South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, all very successful uh, economic engines of East Asia. But at the same time, they seriously uh, suffer from extremely low fertility. And all societies, including Japan, are characterized with highly male-oriented and as well as patriarchal society. These are very difficult traditions to change. Now, if uh, women from Japan, including myself, uh, Dr. Ogata has been a great role model for us to achieve a similar position or a similar sort of, uh, uh, sort of career. And now, if uh, Japan is facing a low fertility society and then therefore uh, extremely rapidly aging society, then Japan should open the door, corporate doors or bureaucracies or uh, society in general has to welcome a quiet social revolution, meaning attaining gender equity. That is, I think that is a solution. If women are English speaking, well-trained, uh, Japanese women are up for peacekeeping for the world or education, I think there is a great revolution to achieve. Thank you. I realize I'm in a hot spot. <laughs> I don't mean. <laughs> and uh, I will not repeat the mistake that my uh, graduate school uh, colleague Larry Summers made uh, a few years ago. <laughs> I'll be very careful. Uh, <laughs> when I said, um, you know, aspiration uh, uh, is uh, uh, getting lower, um, I, th this is my personal observation. I have been teaching in, uh, in uh, Japanese universities many years, and um, uh, also looking back, my, my days uh, of the graduate school, that um, 
you know, I, I, on average, um, I don't see um, the rising of the interest uh, and the hunger of uh, uh, doing a, a better job in uh, academically and also international uh, arena. Um, but that, that is average, and um, I, I take your point that Japanese women uh, now has much higher aspiration and training than the, um, say, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So average and women, then, which means that Japanese men are losing a lot of aspiration uh, uh, nowadays. So, uh, so uh, that, that's a, a reconciliation between uh, my uh, statements and, and, and your statements. Um, yes, the Japanese women are advancing a lot, lot more. I think the corporate door has been open, especially, uh, especially in uh, uh, the uh, foreign companies in Japan, uh, taking a lot of Japanese women who are capable and speaking English and so on. Japanese ministries actually are um, opening doors, much more so than before. So the about 30%, 30% uh, of the um, uh, many ministries uh, are women, intake uh, are women. Uh, now we haven't seen the women female prime minister, we haven't seen the female um, uh, the top uh, bureaucrat uh, uh, positions yet, but I'm sure uh, that those uh, uh, will come uh, in uh, uh, in due time. The um, um, so um, uh, and and let me say one more word on low fertility. I think it's uh, disgraceful that uh, the support for the um, uh, uh, working mothers uh, uh, support is uh, very. Uh, uh, a very small, weak, and um, I, I would be. Um, I, I am in favor of supporting those working mothers, and and there are a lot of a lot of dimensions in it that uh, the pediatricians and and uh, gynecologists are in shortage, and uh, the uh, the. Uh, Institutions to give the um, uh, the the working mothers uh, to take two years off and and so on that is also weak, uh, but you know those are changing and hopefully that uh, we we change the institutions in time. Thank you. Just just uh, ten second. My wife is a specialist of low fertility. And according to her, uh, it has much to do with the uh, uh, male-dominated tradition in Japanese society. But I, I agree with all, all your points except for one. That is, there's a lot of opportunity in, in Japan for young women. Uh, as far as they are capable and as far as they are ambitious, there are a lot of opportunities. Don't worry too much about that. <laughs> you say that there are many, women, I see a lot of Japanese uh, young women here, they're very hard working, they're, but it, things are changing, as you said. Um, I am running JICA, which is really for overseas development assistance, uh, yet last year we take, took about 38 professionals last year, half were women, and then of the, of the uh, overseas um, volunteers, and I think uh, your daughter is one of them. 60% are women. And so for those who want to do, who want to be out in the big world and are, have the guts, it's not easy. But ambitious, women are going in. So don't uh, be despair is what I would like to say. It is fertility, is, uh, it's not high among the young. But, but Japanese women were marrying rather uh, older than Americans. No? And, uh, <laughs> American uh, m marrying very young, I think. And then they get divorced very often. But, <laughs> but, but at the same time, women are making inroads. I, but it still requires a lot, lot more of efforts. So be strong and uh, be hopeful, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I think we have time maybe for one last question.
very much for the insightful talks. Um, my name is Aya Kumie. I'm a graduate student well, for the uh, Graduate School of Journalism here. Um, I have a question for Dr. Pempel. You described the last eight years of relationship between, between Japan and the United States as overly, mutually bilateral relationships. So what do you think this Obama administration should do with the relationship with Japan? I mean, how do you think they should recapitulate this relationship? Okay. Um. I think it's a very complicated process, and I'm, I'm, I'm let me start by saying I think the U.S.-Japan bilateral relationship is very positive for both countries, and I'm not challenging that. But I think that the uh, important thing that both Japan and the United States need to recognize is that Northeast Asia in particular and the world more broadly are changing from the Cold War period in which the alliance was put into place, and that U.S.-Japan cooperation now can uh, be broadened to include much closer cooperation among Japan, the United States, and China, for example. So I would be very much in favor of a trilateral dialogue among those three countries. I think that the United States uh, should return uh, in ways that the Bush administration was not active in, in participating in, in organizations like APEC and the ASEAN Regional Forum. Uh, as many of you know, Condi Rice skipped two of the three meetings in the ARF. Uh, which sent, I think, a dreadful message across Asia about American interest in the in the region, and I think that you know one of the one of the perennial problems uh, in the bilateral relationship is that uh, an awful lot of Japan's political leaders spend an inordinate amount of time wondering if America still likes them. Uh, <laughs> you know, when I was director of the Institute of East Asian Studies here. Virtually every Japanese visitor would at some point or another ask me the inevitable question, how many students are there studying Japanese? And I would say, well, Japanese is the third most popular language at Berkeley. Uh, and they would say, oh, that's wonderful, that's terrific. And then they would say, well, what's number one, French or Spanish? And I would say, no, Chinese. And immediately their eyes would sag and they'd, <laughs> you know, oh, geez, you know. But what they fail to understand is that China is about 10 times larger than Japan. There are 10 times more Chinese-speaking Chinese when they're born than Japanese-speaking. There's no, no inherent reason why the Japanese should feel that Japanese should be a more popular language at Berkeley than Chinese. But uh, the, the difficulty that I think so many Japanese foreign policy leaders and politicians have had is that having grown up with that mantra that the U.S.-Japan relationship is the most important bilateral relationship in the world, bar none, or that Japan's foreign policy starts from uh, the U.S.-Japan bilateral security arrangement, there's a, there's a, a continual fear that um, Japan will somehow be quickly abandoned in the, in the face of a rising China. And I think both the United States and Japan need to provide reassurances to one another, but at the same time, uh, to weave China into, into that equation uh, and to look for areas where China, Japan, and the United States can share interests. One of the areas where I think they share a great deal of interest, although it hasn't been that apparent lately, is in the denuclearization of the North Korean area. Uh, they all have similar interests. They've pursued it in very strange ways, and Japan seems now far more concerned about uh, the fate of several abductees than about denuclearization, uh, which is something that I tend not to share the view on, but, uh, but it seems to me that uh, it's time now to move beyond bilateralism and uh, to take this relationship in new directions which take advantage of Japan's strengths, which may be complementary to and quite different from those of the United States, rather than simply assuming that uh, Japan should be a mini U.S. and do everything the U.S. does and follow the U.S. lockstep. Uh, Japan is a much more mature democracy and I think can begin to uh, move in some inter interesting directions on its own, and that can be complementary to the U.S. And so Northeast Asian security and Northeast Asian economic development is one of those major areas, but human security and non-traditional security areas, pandemics, uh, sea lane security, a whole host of these things would be areas for cooperation. A uh, much longer answer, I think, than I should have given, given the fact that I'm between you and drinks. Thank you, TJ. I'd like to give uh, one final word to each of the other panelists, first Dr. Kitoka and then Dr. Ito. Thank you very much. Uh, once Douglas MacArthur told Japanese people that Japan should become uh, Switzerland in the East. And uh, uh, several years ago, there was an essay on a, a weekly magazine, 
about the uh, second Switzerland, Japan. Japan is rich, comfortable, and irrelevant <laughs> to, to, to the international community. And this, is, uh, this view is probably supported by the uh, kind of uh, left-wing people who do not like to touch upon any uh, responsibility, to shoulder any responsibility. Uh, this is, uh, 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 in my view, this is uh, uh, unconstitutional because it's uh, written in, in the preamble of a constitution that uh, Japan should occupy, Japan is willing to occupy a uh, uh, honorary place in the international community. On the right hand, uh, there is another group who is saying that uh, 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 Japan has been conducted, engaged in a peace-loving diplomacy since the war but uh, Japan's position has not been uh, uh, duly appreciated by the neighboring countries. Uh, look, so that means our peace-loving diplomacy was wrong. So let's discard it and go to a, a normal country line. Uh, they are wrong in my view. And uh, those two groups have one thing in common. They, do not have, uh, uh, they are not paying enough attention to international responsibility. And uh, that's a pity. I think uh, the, the we sh the solution should be just in between. And then uh, I kind of a little bit uh, uh, would like to defer from TJ. Uh, uh, I was uh, forced to work uh, to pursue uh, Security Council reform in 2005 when uh, while Koizumi was uh, doing no effort to persuade Bush uh, while offending China by a repeated visit of uh, Yasukuni which was an awful situation. But uh, uh, actually, I'm not in a position to defend him, but uh, his uh, goal, as you said, uh, you said military kind of goal, his uh, military goal was much more modest compared to the other big powers. And also, his, uh, he did some effort to disen disengage Japan's presence in Iraq from uh, the United States. And also, there was some uh, correlation between uh, Japan's uh, security situation vis-a-vis -vis North Korea at that time. So uh, the uh, strong commitment from the United States was deadly necessary. And also, uh, behind the curtain, Koizumi tried to persuade Bush not to be so independent to go to Iraq war. And that's uh, something I wanted to add. And after Koizumi came Abe and also now, and Abe and Aso were part, the, 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 of, of course, of course, yeah, Fukuda is in between, but uh, <laughs> yes, uh, one thing in common is that Abe and Aso were supported, partially supported by a kind of right-wing people. But at the same time, he, he, they had some support from the middle. And then there was a, a very heated debate between the so original supporter for Abe and uh, uh, the practical-minded people to support Abe at the very beginning of Abe administration. And the result was the victory of the middle way. And then that's why Abe went into uh, uh, China and uh, made a good improvement between the, the relationship between the two countries. And also was uh, 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 on the appointment of Aso, China had some concern about him, but uh, actually he uh, chose also the, the more pragmatic way. So now the relationship between, uh, needless to, to say about the good situation between Fu Jintao and Fukuda, but even with Aso, and even from Abe, our uh, relation with China has improved uh, dramatically. So now uh, uh, many people are now uh, uh, optimistic about the relation with China. Uh, I can say that uh, from my capacity as a, a chair of uh, Japanese scholars in Japan-China Joint Study of History. Uh, so I'm not too pessimistic. And now uh, uh, what's important is uh, to be confident and uh, uh, to say, uh, Yes, we can, something like that. <laughs> well, now, uh, because the international system is not changing, and then uh, the G8 may be uh, uh, increased into G13 or 20. And then why not Security Council? Uh, the, there uh, is another plan uh, created by Madame Ogata, like a Model B, uh, which is uh, different from uh, uh, creating real new permanent member. Uh, so the Security Council reform is within our reach. So we should not be uh, too pessimistic about the future. Thank you. Okay, um, one word on the uh, economic side of the new uh, uh, administration uh, in the US and, and, and Japan. The many people in Japan and also uh, in Korea and uh, China worried about the protection, protectionism 
uh, of the uh, possible protectionism of the uh, new administration. Uh, they associate the Obama as the sort of return of the Clinton, uh, 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 Clinton people. And uh, we had unfortunate uh, uh, sort of the economic conflict uh, in the first uh, uh, Clinton administration. Uh, and um, uh, people who worried about uh, Obama administration is, uh, uh, has a memory from that period. Uh, my personal uh, prediction is that uh, those protectionism uh, would not happen in the Obama administration. Uh, just try to uh, read what the advisors have been saying. And so um, uh, that, that's my prediction. And also uh, another aspect is at least uh, US-Japan uh, relations. Um, I think the economic war protectionism wouldn't happen because of the relative standing of Japan now is greatly different from uh, Japan in 1992. So um, I, I, I would not worry too much about the economic uh, uh, conflict between US and, and, and Japan. Um, now, another one word, um, uh, one minute, um, uh, about the right and left uh, in Japan. Um, in the U.S., uh, uh, right, uh, political right and economic right uh, are usually uh, are the, uh, the same. That uh, the right wing uh, uh, in, in, in the U.S. Uh, is uh, usually supporting the small government and less spending, uh, usually, uh, and, and, and so on. Um, but in Japan, the political right and left and economic right and left uh, uh, do not necessarily uh, uh, meet. And uh, liberal democratic parties uh, have a spectrum from left to right. And the Japanese Democrats uh, uh, have an uh, even wider spectrum of right uh, to left. And they are really mixed up in, in the same party, and you never know uh, the, which faction would take the uh, power uh, when the administration comes in. So th that's what uh, Professor Kitaoka uh, mentioned on the political side. But even the economic uh, axis, it's even more mixed up. And um, uh, sometimes people are politically left, but economically right. And sometimes uh, uh, right-wing politicians, so-called, are believing in more left-wing economics. So um, uh, it, it is really a confusing uh, uh, state. One, uh, an ASO government, which, um, uh, which uh, will face the general election uh, by September next year, which the, when the House of Representatives uh, uh, term expires, um, and next election, uh, general election, will be very um, interesting, to say the least. And uh, there may be some drastic change in the economic, uh, 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 no, political, and also economic uh, 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 scene uh, in Japan. So uh, the next administration in the US um, uh, will have probably very tentative um, attitude towards uh, ASO administration, knowing that this administration will not last long. If I hope all of you can stay and join us for some refreshments in a moment. But first, please join me in thanking Dr. Ogata, Dr. Scalapino, and our distinguished panelists, Dr. Kitaoka, Dr. Ito, and Dr. Pimpel. Thank you.